Coming to you live around the world from NOV's Studio 202, this is Inside Out Horizons. With your hosts, Lydia Mabry, Jeremy Griswold, Cass Casey, and Shelby Dumain. Now, let's start the show. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. Welcome to Inside Out Horizons. My name is Shelby Dumain, and I'm so excited to bring you an incredible show today. We're talking about geothermal energy, which is a really exciting topic, so we're, we're so thankful for you to join us, uh, like I said, wherever in the world you are watching from. Before we get to the main conversation, I did just want to remind everybody that at the end of the show, um, we might be doing some Q&A. So if you have any questions, go ahead and post those in the comments, whether you're watching on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, uh, wherever you're watching, go ahead and leave your questions um, for our guest today. And we're going to get to as many of those as we can there at the end. Um, in the meantime, or before we do that, uh, so you can get into the show, I have your host for the day. I want to bring it over to her. We have Lyd Lydia. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Excited yeah, to be here. Absolutely. Tell us about our guest. Yes. So we're here. We're with Jamie Beard, so the executive director of the Geothermal Energy Organization. Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship close, Organization. Got See, I'm telling you. <laughs> okay, so GEO for short. Uh, but today we're going to talk about um, something that I think is really interesting and that a lot of people don't really fully understand, which is geothermal energy. And you are quite the expert, so excited to get into it. Well, thanks. Um, so thanks, kind Andy. of just as a long lead-in, 12 years ago, I remember that all the cool young kids at NOV were really talking about mm -hmm. geothermal energy or how we could harness the Earth's heat and convert it into usable energy. Um, we thought that the same drilling and completion technologies that we use to develop shale, namely horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, could apply to this parallel market, and we were eager to pursue it. And then kind of nothing happened. Um, my personal interest waned quickly um, because geothermal really struck me as something that was maybe geographically specific, uh, risky, expensive, and frankly, pretty niche. Um, and I never really thought about it again until an acquaintance in the oil and gas industry left oil and gas to go work for a geothermal startup about a year ago now. Yep. And so that's really what I want to talk about today of kind of why geothermal, why now, and why should the oil and gas industry care and focus on it? Yeah. So. Well, about 12 years ago is when I got engaged in geothermal. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's, it's about the same time. Um, it's, it's really interesting that you say that. And, and I, I'm happy to hear of your colleague that ran into geothermal. It's kind of a rocket ship, and that's happening all over the industry right now. So we can, we can definitely chat about that. So it makes sense um, that there was a burst of energy for geothermal within the oil and gas industry a decade or, you know, even two decades ago. Mm -hmm. And, and there was some investment in, you know, coming from the industry back then and in, in, into geothermal. But back then, um, you know, the world was really, you know, really engaging in, in traditional geothermal or hydrothermal. Okay. So, you know, these are the types of geothermal projects that you find in places like Iceland, um, Ring of Fire, California, where you have, you know, geologically perfect conditions that don't require a whole lot of subsurface engineering right. to produce the resource, so either producing it for heat or electricity. Um, but it's fairly easy to produce um, okay. and, and drill for, right? So you have pore space in the rocks, it's hot near the surface, and you have uh, water or brine beneath the surface in those conditions, right? Got so it. everything is perfect, and that is indeed niche. Right. So when the, when the industry started looking at these projects, and, and there was even some investment, particularly coming out of operators in, in these types of projects, I think that the, the more that teams dug in, they realized that from a scale perspective, there was a, there really wasn't enough of it in the world to interest the oil and gas industry. Right. Because the oil and gas industry looks at scale. Mm -hmm. They want global scale. Right, there exactly. has to be the ability to grow exponentially and to continue to grow. Well, it right. makes the economics work. Right. Exactly right. 
And so you, you, you saw this quick flourish where there was an understanding that there was a lot of overlap in core competency. Look, this could be very cool. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's a carbon neutral technology. It's, a, you know, it's renewable and sustainable. Let's do it. Oh, wait. This is niche. Right, right. And, and so you, you saw divestment where there was investment and everybody kind of washed their hands and walked. And was that just because at the time people weren't looking at how to mimic those natural conditions right. artificially? Well, we were just at the, you know, we were, we were in the middle or at the beginning in some of these instances of the shale boom where all, there was this gigantic flourish of technological innovation in the industry that is ultimately really enabling for geothermal in terms of doing it anywhere okay. or in most places in the world, right? Okay. So, you know, in industry, in, in the industry is really big. This is something I've learned over the past dec you know, decade is um, it takes once there's a, a decision by a big operator say that they're mm -hmm. not they're going to divest and move on right um it takes a you know it takes some years to turn that around if there's going to be a different decision right yes. and so literally now we're at this point where wait there's all this technologically you know there's all this tech technology enablement that's come out of say deep water exploration mm -hmm. and also the shale boom now got we've it. got horizontal drilling we know how to drill directionally we know how to do high pressure and temperature stuff right? how do we apply it to this other resource exactly right so it's taken a minute for the oil and gas industry to relook at geothermal and say okay but wait maybe it's not just hydrothermal that we should look at hydrothermal is the low-hanging fruit but there's this bigger prize was there anything, so just thinking about that, so hydrothermal, we're saying we're kind of um, geographically specific, occurs in a few places, right. but easy to tap. So investments were made, interest was there, and then again waned when people realized somewhat limited. Was there something else spurring the renewed interest besides technological advancement in the oil and gas industry? Was yeah. there public focus, governmental focus, or how did that yeah. play in? <clears throat> well, my view is this. It, it's, it's been a really interesting convergence of factors over the past 24 months that has kind of resulted in this frenzy and excitement, mm -hmm. right? So you do have, you know, you know leaps in, in technology that are uniquely enabling where it, you know, geothermal anywhere doesn't seem so moonshotty and okay. ridiculous. It seems attainable you can at least envision within the next decade getting there right and making because it of the technologies correct. that you've seen in other right areas. so it's, okay. it's more incremental instead mm -hmm. of this you know gigantic disruptive moonshot right. right there's that but there's also you know over the past decade carbon neutrality commitments mm -hmm. you know particularly coming out of majors where behind the scenes they're like oh how are we going to do this right right, right. Um, so there's there's a lot of curiosity about you know ways to get where they want to be. Um, Geothermal is really interesting mm -hmm. from that perspective because it actually leverages core competency. You also have a lot of climate angst in the world right. and a lot of pressure and a lot of um, a lot of buzz about you know you know shifting into you know ener energy transition and shifting into cleaner. Um, sources of energy and the way that's putting pressure on industry isn't just climate angst and media and the public but it's 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 being um, it's divestment movements right um, it's private equity you know it's it's these it's funding sources that are now putting pressure right I'm smiling because I'm thinking about sustainability reporting right now and a big topic is energy transition impact on business mix yep so it's core business model resilience but then it's also how you're investing in technologies that help lower your customers' exactly. carbon and environmental footprint. Yeah. So you know, it, the the pressure that I'm seeing that's that's most effective in in getting the oil and gas industry engaged, coming from say environmental circles, isn't mm -hmm. necessarily what you see on the news as much as it's you know energy analysts and private equity asking oil and gas CEOs, hey, what's your geothermal strategy? Right. Right. And then oil and gas CEO turning around and saying what's our geothermal strategy, <laughs> right? And so that, and that's happened over the past 12 months or so and started to happen. And it's really interesting because it's making things move inside of entities. Well, so thinking about what people's geothermal strategies could be, taking a step back, how does geothermal compare to other energy sources, whether it's oil and gas or other renewables? Yeah, so let's take let's take traditional energy first. Okay. Geothermal, I think that's probably the most, one of the most exciting things about geothermal when you compare it to traditional energy sources like oil and gas. Um, 
from the oil and gas industry perspective, it leverages just about all core competencies of the industry. It's, okay. it's, it requires subsurface expertise. Um, it, you know, you've got exploration for the resource. You've got, you know, you know, con, you know, well construction and engineering. You have drilling that you need. You also have, you know, operation of, right. of the resource. Um, and you even have the surface plant which the oil and gas industry is great at in, mm -hmm. you know, say, the refinery context, right, where you have these long-term operations. And so, you know, geothermal hits at every core competency of the industry, really leveraging not only the workforce, which is highly skilled, right. but also, you know, PhD-level brains that are thinking about how to, you know, how to make oil and gas technologies work in the oil and gas context, all of that is transferable to geothermal. So it's really like a truly parallel market where a lot of times you talk about um, competency overlap in oil and gas industry applying to renewables, whether like on right. an NOV side of the manufacturing footprint, the scale, the project yeah, expertise, right. that applies yeah, to yeah. wind. But what you're talking about in geothermal is like, no, it's really the stuff that you all do every <laughs> exactly. day, yeah. not just as a manufacturer, but as an oil field services industry Correct. at large of drilling into the earth um, or, or even backing up from that subsurface exploration. exploration. Yeah, right. and then drilling and accessing. Yeah. So I've, I've always kind of bristled at the argument that, yeah, oil and gas you know, is going to be great at developing huge solar projects because oil and gas has operational knowledge for these big projects. This will right. work. I don't buy that mm -hmm. entirely, right? And I don't think that's necessarily the way industry should be thinking about energy transition because you can't lead on the back foot. And oil and gas doesn't do solar, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's there's not hundreds of years of expertise right. coming to the table on solar. But, you know, if you start looking at subsurface, so you're, you know, you know carbon sequestration, for instance, right. geothermal, it's more you're direct. coming to the, right, you're leading that way because you, it is core competency. And that's why I think geothermal is such a, you know, exciting, an exciting prospect for oil and gas. So really, you know, if you compare geothermal with traditional energy sources, you've got a lot of overlap. You just minus the, minus the carbon which is the, you know, the all the rage these days, right? right? So yeah. there's the there's the comparison there. If you compare geothermal with uh, renewables. traditional renewables, mm -hmm. okay? So let's say, you know, solar and wind. Geothermal is is exciting in a couple of ways compared to those two uh, energy sources because they it solves a lot of the problems associated with those energy sources. Okay. Like namely what? intermittency. So solar and wind aren't always on. So that's like when we're talking about base load capabilities and when people discuss of like, okay, well, you can put up a wind turbine, but right. it's not always windy, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. And, and, you, and you see a lot of investment and a lot of angst about energy storage, right, in the, right. In the news. And that's, of course, trying to solve that problem. Um, and, you know, and, and massive grid scale energy storage projects have their own environmental problems. Yes. Um, you, you've got a lot of rare earth mining, a lot of lithium mining. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, geothermal shines that way because geothermal doesn't need energy storage. Geothermal is base load. It's always on. It's 24 seven. It's resilient, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it operates in the subsurface. Um, so it's, it's not, say, you know, it, it doesn't have the vulnerabilities that wind would have, say, in extreme weather. So right. despite the appeal, the reason that it's been overlooked, does that go back to what you were talking about, conventional hydrothermal of people kind of writing it off as something that's geographically specific and niche? Yep. Okay. Yeah. I mean, geothermal has a, um, you know, and, and, and in this way, it's, it, we might bring in fusion to the conversation. Okay. So this is something that, that, really, um, that really irritates me about the, the way um, new sources of energy, particularly baseload sources of energy, are portrayed in the media, mm -hmm. right? So just this morning, there was this headline news article about fusion saving the world, okay. right? Fusion, <laughs> fusion, fusion, baseload. This is what the world right. needs. It's so close. Like nuclear. <laughs> it's almost close. It's, we're yeah. almost, no, it's not. It's not close, right? It's decades away and billions and billions and billions of dollars of investment away, Okay. right? Yet this headline was, it's almost there. It's very exciting. You Flash never see that for geothermal. Why is that? Right? Well, because cool. everybody dismisses geothermal as, oh, yeah, whatever. That's Iceland. 
right? And Chile, right? Like, isn't there? Yeah, know, there's a lot of I mean, South it's America. It's a volcano. Appeal. You yes. have to have a <laughs> volcano, right? And so geothermal does suffer right now from this this global bias of well whatever it's been around forever and it hasn't done anything mm -hmm. when really there's something huge that has been overlooked which is technological innovation and our ability to apply learnings from the oil and gas industry industry to scale and the really interesting comparison between geothermal and fusion mm -hmm. is that geothermal is so much closer so much closer than fusion to being able to, you know, provide terawatt scale, terawatt scale okay, that's energy for the world, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, I mean, if you even if you think of the hard stuff in geothermal, so, you know, drillers listening, think drilling to 10 kilometers and 400 degrees Celsius. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's the geothermal anywhere prospect, being right. able to do it anywhere in the world, power the world, solve climate change, solve energy, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you think of that, as the moonshot for geothermal, that is so more, so much more technologically enabled currently than fusion. Okay. Yet fusion's garnering billions of dollars worth of and support. And the headlines. Right? And right. headlines. So we really need to be pushing on that, right? Because geothermal needs to be that. Do you think so but people haven't, I guess, realized or accepted that this is a possibility? Is that's what is that what's happening or I mean, it's, <laughs> it's happening slowly, okay. right? I mean, okay. you see a lot of this buzz. Um, it, it's really, it's kind of a drip, drip, drip of big news for geothermal, right? right? Where, you know, we had the, we had a startup yesterday in geothermal with a new drilling technology raised $40 million. Well, that's the biggest, that's the biggest one-time raise for a, for a geothermal company ever. Well, that's right? what, yeah, I wanted to talk about some of that buzz because you did a TED Talk six months ago, and in that talk, you mentioned that in the past 18 months, that more geothermal startups had launched than in the past 10 years right. combined. Yep. And so thinking about that, so is the renewed interest really just tied to people's recognition that the technology is there, the competency is there? Yep. Um, yeah, so, and I, this makes sense if you, if you step back and look at it, because it, it's kind of the way everything, the world works in terms of big disruptions. It happened in the car industry too with right. the Teslas of the world that get out in front, their startup companies, they lead, and then the entire industry follows. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's happening with geothermal right now in the oil and gas industry. Okay. So you, you have a lot of, you know, Geo, my job at Geo when I started was to start recruiting oil and gas people into geothermal. I thought it would be hard. It was not hard. Okay. Right. So I started talking with retired executives. I started talking with people within the industry, trying to get them excited about starting companies. Mm -hmm. Right. Thinking that startups will be really the vehicle for innovation here. You're going to have the fast movers, the people that are really excited, the people that buy the vision and run. Right. And then eventually give it five or 10 years. Industry will Bigger just buy them follow. all. Oh, right. No, I mean, they'll just be acquired. Right. Eventually. And the oil and gas industry will flip the switch and they're, you know, they become geo the geothermal industry. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what is happening. And by okay, 2030, we may be there. Right. Okay. Where, so yeah, so you have this right now where the very beginning of that curve, where you've got this flourish of startups, they are largely run by oil and gas industry veterans mm -hmm. and workforce who have either left industry or were retired, came out of retirement and went and started drilling geothermal wells. Okay. And so you mentioned your friend that right. left to, that's happening all over the place. People okay. are jumping out of operators, they're jumping out of oil fill service, they're going and raising money from venture capital, even climate philanthropy, and they're going out and drilling geothermal projects. Interesting. And they're trying new things, they're trying new methods that they've pulled out of oil and gas that have never been applied to geothermal, which is amazing and it's awesome. Right? Well, that's what I was going to ask because it seems like some of the appeal to these people would be the familiarity exactly. of the technology. Exactly right. And um, I guess the familiarity of the application. But are there other technologies that are needed um, that we have to develop or breakthroughs that we need to see to get geothermal to the scale that you're envisioning? Like if we want to do it anywhere in the world, yes, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of low hanging fruit. Okay. Right? So many of the startups that are launching with oil and gas veterans are off for low hanging fruit. The stuff that is easy to produce now, you know, that can be providing megawatts to grids, et cetera, right. et cetera. 
if you know you 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 go ten years down the road and we want to go deeper and hotter, yeah, there's going to be some challenges there. And you know, folks in the oil and gas industry understand them okay. and have ideas about that. Okay, right. So you have new new drilling methods popping up here and there now, coming out of you know, quite frankly, it's the, you know the company yesterday that ray that with the forty million rays. That's a former oil and gas uh, person from Schlumberger. Okay. Yep. And that's the CEO, uh, Carlos, jumped out of Schlumberger, started Quays, and now he's off to the races on millimeter wave drilling, which is an, an energy-based drilling concept. I was going to say, that's something I've never heard of. Really interesting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so you, you have um, folks with a lot of excitement, a lot of energy, and you know a lot of ideas that they've pulled out of their experience in the oil and gas industry. And many of them try within their entities first to get stuff started, right? That's where I was going to ask. Yep. Kind of like, does tried. this need to exist right. in a startup realm versus existing within a traditional oil and gas company? To, at least to start. Well, so it, it's, it's, it's happening the way it has to happen now, which is folks are trying within their entities first. If they're not getting quick enough traction or they're not seeing the excitement they need, they're jumping out of their, in, you know, their, into, their oil and gas entities into existing startups or starting their own companies and okay. running. Okay. You know, going and getting funding and running. All right. With the idea that, well, I'm not waiting. Eventually it will happen, but I'm going to go and do this thing, right? But the way I see this and, and the optimal outcome here is that we don't build a parallel industry of startups that are going to become gigantic companies. Right. That's pretty slow and inefficient, mm -hmm. right? And so ideally, over the coming years, we'll end up in a situation where oil and gas entities will look at this, feel and understand that they're fully enabled to do these projects completely on their own with their internal workforce that they okay. already have, that they just need to, you know, retitle. Right. Essentially. Okay. Instead of, you know, we need to put geothermal in front of exploration. A geothermal reservoir engineer, <laughs> right. for example. Yep. Okay. I mean, and, and that realization is is slowly happening. But again, you're talking about gigantic entities that take a minute. Right. So, you know. So that maybe in kind of your ideal scenario, if I'm hearing it right, that you may have these groups outside of companies, at least for the time being, to start development, but eventually get to a point where these ideas are incubating Correct. within an organization and yeah. then developed from there. And you're seeing that with the startups now that are that did peel out, peel out of industry, but they've gone and they've found investors within industry that are large operators and large oil field service companies. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's that it's ha that's actually happening faster than I thought it would, which okay. is very exciting. Well, recognizing that not everyone is as excited about geothermal as you. Um, <laughs> no. How do you address, <laughs> you know, the naysayers? Um, the people who are like, you know what, Jamie, this is all pie in the sky, but yeah, it's still not going to work. Well, so it depends on which type of naysayer. Well, we can uh, we can run through all the different types. Okay. Um, geothermal is really cool because it sits in the middle of two worlds, and everybody finds stuff to love about it. But the the flip side of that is everyone also finds stuff to hate about it. Okay. Right. And so you have um, naysayers in the oil and gas industry that um, you know don't see this. Mm -hmm. Right. It either expensive. It'll never be economically feasible for oil and gas. It's never going to be technologically enabled by right. oil and you know. There's okay. that. Um, I would say to that, okay, but pause. If you look at you know oil and gas entities that have spun off new energies arms in solar and wind, and you know that are going off and doing solar and wind projects and becoming right. utilities, mm -hmm. those groups have figured out ways to. Um, get comfortable with pretty low rates of return, and I'm talking about like two, three, four percent on projects. Geothermal's higher than that. Okay. Right. So you're saying if you can redirect some of your investment, you think that this is a higher return. If you can get comfortable renewable. being a utility as a parent company, <laughs> okay. Not as a spin, not as a new energies arm, but as a parent company. Mm -hmm. If you can get comfortable producing electrons instead of barrels of oil then you should be, get comfortable. Well, and you need to get comfortable with the subsurface risk of geothermal, which solar and wind don't have. Okay. But if you can deal with that, which, by the way, is within your core competency, right. you're going to have a higher rate of return than solar and wind. So look at that, because okay. you don't have to replace your entire workforce. You can do geothermal, right? But does that subsurface risk, is that overwhelming 
to a lot of people. Is it overwhelming in the oil and gas context? I mean, I, I, I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Well, just, is it really different the, from the risk in oil and gas or is it similar? Look, if you look at the next generation geothermal projects where the, the subsurface is engineered entirely and you're actually introducing you know, next gen working fluids like CO2 in the surface and you're producing heat with okay. these next gen fluids, you don't have to plan on, say, hitting a, a perfect a aquifer and, and, you know, having production rates that you predict the, in a naturally occurring system, which is, you know, there is subsurface risk for hydrothermal. Right. You know, okay. when you're looking for those, that perfect sweet spot that mm -hmm. occurs naturally in the world, mm -hmm. that's hard. Right. But if you're planning, you know, greenfields developments where you are engineering everything about it, mm -hmm. think about that. Right. So it's kind of like a it reduces almost risk. a laboratory type condition is what you're That's looking right. at. Exactly. Okay. So, you know, the, so the, the oil and gas naysayers, I would say, there are a couple of things to get comfortable with. It's a different business model. You become a utility, but ask your new energies folks because they did it for solar and wind. Right. You make less money, but ask your new energies folks. They did it for solar and wind and geothermal's okay. higher. Subsurface risk. Let's get it down. Okay. Oil and gas core competency. Bam. That's what I would say to oil and gas naysayers. Okay. Right. What about people who say... Okay, solar and wind, the reason why it's successful is because it's subsidized. Mm. Um, that's what makes it economically efficient. Sure. That's <clears throat> what allows us to scale. So yeah. kind of like, all right, I buy your argument, but I'm still not really into solar and wind, so why this? Yeah, so solar and wind enjoyed decades and decades of subsidy, which has gotten solar and wind where it is today in terms of cost. Absolutely right. Okay. If we sit around, you know, from the oil and gas industry perspective, if we sit around and wait for that, for geothermal, game over. Right. Like it's not going to happen. Go. Just go. Because, you know, sure, we can beat the drum on it's not fair. Geothermal was not subsidized and it really wasn't. It hasn't mm -hmm. been. It hasn't been supported the way solar and wind was. But the but the way the cost curves are looking for solar and wind, if we sit around and wait for geothermal to catch up on subsidy, it will You're never catch up there. to solar and wind. What will make it catch up with solar and wind is the oil and gas industry in terms of scale, in terms of technology transfer, right? Okay. Okay. So there's a there's the traditional folks. That's that's traditional energy folks naysayers, um, environmental naysayers. So there's envi there's naysayers on the other side of the aisle too. Are they thinking about what resource and efficiency, or what's their um, major qualms? Or there, what are there are two major, major ones. Well, there are three. Okay. Um, two of them are, um, you know, project risk, and one of them is um, just polarization. Okay. Um, the the project risks are the use of hydraulic fracturing to engineer systems. Oh, so kind of like I hated this when it affected. I don't like fracking. I, right, I hated it in I oil don't and gas. Care if it's geothermal, I really don't like it right? applied to another market. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and second is the potential for induced seismicity, related to fracking. Correct. Okay. Or operation of the plant. Okay. Which you know has happened in in the geothermal context in the world. And that's a big hurdle. It is, but it's one that the oil and gas industry, in my opinion, is is very well suited to think about standardize and solve. Well, has has tried to manage effectively, but I still think, you it's, know, faces issues. Correct. Right. But if there's an entity in the world that is best positioned to think about that on a global scale, mm -hmm. standardize and share information, oil it's and oil and gas. gas. It's oil and gas. Right now, um, geothermal projects have experienced seismicity um, but there's been no data sharing about that. The, the geothermal industry is very localized. It's very piecemeal. Um, there's not a lot of standardization. There's not a lot of data sharing. There's not a lot of learning from each other's projects. Okay. And you can't, you can't build on that, right? right? You, can't, you can't build a system where you're avoiding and mitigating risk with the, with the paradigm that exists now. Right. right. You need more collaboration and kind Correct. of sharing across... Exactly right. People who are experiencing the same issues. Yep, that's right. In order to learn quickly. So, so there's there's those, and and look, um, the I, I view um, the the visceral reaction to the to, to fracking mm -hmm. and the and the and the geothermal concepts that utilize fracking. Um, I, I think that's a, a, a concern, and I think it's a very difficult problem because it does really pull on people's deep, deeply held beliefs and emotions. Right. It's very emotional for mm -hmm. a lot of groups. And I think that the solution there is going to be convening, having everyone at the table, stakeholder engagement. And I mean that. 
I don't mean just running off, doing geothermal at scale, ignoring concerns. I think that we really need to focus for geothermal on a more collaborative um, approach. And so I guess kind of looking at social license to operate, Correct. making that a major focus Extre area. And that brings me to the third problem. You know, does geothermal lose its social license to operate if the oil and gas industry becomes the geothermal industry? It's possible. It's possible. And, and I think that's really going to be on the oil and gas industry to take, to take that seriously and to really learn from the mistakes from the shale boom in that regard. I mean, the reason people have these visceral reactions to fracking, right. really workshop that, figure out how to not do that for geothermal and fix it this time. Because we get on the exponential growth curve of the shale boom for geothermal, and this is going to repeat, mm -hmm. right? We're going to be there all over again if right. we don't figure out how to do this differently for geothermal. And so th that would really, it's really my plea as, as you know, entities get really excited about this to reach out to environmental NGOs and get them in task forces, okay. right? As you think and plan and start, you know, looking at projects and really engage local governments and, right. and things like that, right? So, well, it sounds like you really think that the oil and gas industry is key to geothermal development, but that the oil and gas industry will face challenges as yeah. it goes through this. Sure. So. Absolutely. And, and they, but they are challenges that the oil and gas industry has faced before and can with. learn from. No, nope. right. Fair. And so that's, that's the goal is to, okay, so we've got this model and we know what didn't work. So how do we fix that this time around for right. geothermal? Okay. Well, I could keep asking you plenty of <laughs> questions, but I want to check in with Shelby and see if we have any questions from the audience that we may want to ask Jamie. Yeah, absolutely. We sure do. Uh, this first one comes from Naeem. And he asked, are you seeing a lot of involvement from the startup accelerators and incubators in the geothermal space? Not yet. Um, it, they're, they're, they're catching up. So this, this burst, this geothermal renaissance with startups has, has literally happened over the past 24 months. Where oh, you, wow. It's been fast. Where you have, you've had a couple of startups here and there that have existed in geothermal, um, you know, that, you know, over the past 10 years, there's been some. Mm -hmm. But then over the past 24 months, you've had exponential growth in the number of startups out Was there. Was there like a linchpin to kind of set off that frenzy? Or, I mean, is that oil and gas cyclicality? Is that... It's possible. Yeah. Okay. So, so a lot of the startups that it did start, did start in the last downturn. Um, and it was, you know, demand response COVID related. Okay. Um, a lot of people laid off in industry. Um, me going out trying to find them and convince them to start companies. Some of them did, and then they went and recruited more people who then went and started companies, and you had this catalytic snowball, okay. essentially, where you know every everybody in a geothermal company that's gone and started one right now has a colleague in oil and gas that's also in a company that started one. And so it's just, okay. it's, it's spread like, you know, through word of mouth and just kind of this compounding excitement, which is, which is pretty cool. Yeah, so somewhat flourished on uh -huh. oil and gas and volatility. And it's self-sustaining now, too, where, you know, a, a, there are startups now out there that I've never heard of, and that didn't used to be. Right. You know, I used to have my hands on everybody, and now it's like startups come out of nowhere. I'm an all oil and gas team. Mm -hmm. We want to introduce ourselves. Well, like, where did y'all come from? Well, I can understand the appeal because as you look at new challenges, you say, I want to work on something where my strengths can shine. Yep. So if I'm an oil and gas industry expert or even just an oil and gas employee and I'm looking for something new and different, yep. it seems like based on the things that you're saying, yep. my strengths can shine. Yep. In Plus there's money out there looking for you, right? So and That's there's plenty. got a lot of appeal. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not hard to start a company and raise money right now in this space. Now, are the accelerators and the incubators realizing this? Yes, but it's taken a minute. And, you know, what I do, I don't incubate. I just, I help build an ecosystem and recruit people out of oil and gas into geothermal, right? Okay. So, um, so what I do is, is send startups to existing incubators so they can have a, you know, they can have a clean energy space. Okay. Um, but, you know, there haven't been specific programs built within them yet mm -hmm. um, for geothermal. I bet you that will change here in the next year or so because we're starting just just here in Houston you know there's there's pro probably more than 15 geothermal startups with oil and all oil and gas teams right just here okay that's an ecosystem so that's you're ecosystem. trying to facilitate the connection and strengthen those connections yep. among the Absolutely. ecosystem members yep that's right 
I hear you. Yeah, and Naeem, actually, he had a follow-up question as well. Um, who do you see as the major investors, oil and gas companies, private individuals, or venture capitalist uh, type companies? What are you seeing there? Oh, these are good questions. <laughs> okay, so um, really cool. Some of the first startups that got funded got funded by bedfellows who would have never been seen <laughs> together before. Okay. Climate philanthropy and oil and gas entities doing deals together. together. Yep. Okay. Um, that's really amazing. It also shows that we're having difficulty with venture capital, which is true. So, Interesting. you know, the fact that climate philanthropy is needing to step in or, or, you know, and climate impact funds are needing to step in on, on geothermal deals indicates a problem with venture capital here that exists, which is that um, oil and gas industry veterans um, that start geothermal companies, they, they tend to have so much operational experience and they're in their comfort zone. And so they go from zero to 60 in almost no time, which is we start our company and six months later, we're ready to go drill a $30 million well. Right. Okay, but pause. <laughs> because in, a, in the startup scenario, that there is no funding mechanism that's comfortable with that currently. You mean to accelerate so quickly? In the yeah, investment. I mean, in, in 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 venture capital, you end up where you you know you do a little seed round, and you know a couple hundred thousand or a million, and mm -hmm. you get started, and then you do a Series A, and it's some millions, but it's not ten or twenty or thirty, and you know the typical VC um, cycle isn't fitting well for geothermal because you go from zero to commercial demonstration that costs thirty million with a not a lot in between, right? And so, you know, um, for the venture model, that's a lot of money for a first raise. For private equity, that's a little too much risk, mm -hmm. right? So they're, they're kind of, these projects are kind of falling into this dead zone. So we've got a valley of debt. They don't match any profile. Right. So you've got entities now, venture capital and private equity, trying to build new funding mechanisms, um, you know, using the first of their kind plant problem, right? So a lot of these projects are very novel. They've never been done before. They're demonstration projects. They're using first of their kind um, novel approaches. Um, that increases the risk profile beyond and out of private equity. And so you have entities out there thinking about this okay. and building, um, building funding mechanisms to address this need. Um, so that's coming. That's okay. coming. But for the next, you know, 24 months or so, we're going to need to fill that gap with, you know, impact funds, climate right. funds, essentially. Yeah. And no. that's, that's, you know, that's what most companies and myself are after right now. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. other Shelby that we want to mix in? Oh yeah. <laughs> like you said, our audience, they, they always come through with the great questions. Uh, so this one comes from Merrick on LinkedIn and actually Umesh on LinkedIn asked a similar question. So hopefully this will kind of answer both of your questions. Um, he was wondering, uh, you know, we, you know, we know how to drill wells, this industry, but some wells are already drilled. So what can you say about oh. the reuse uh, of existing or abandoned oil and gas wells? Um, he mentioned many countries like Poland simply lack uh, maybe some goodwill, some legal changes in the field, but how does that look in your point of view? Yeah, so there are, there's an, a whole ecosystem of startups um, out there pursuing this. Um, there are millions of oil and gas wells, it's true. They sometimes coincide with good geothermal gradients. Some of the wells are hot. Most wells aren't. Oil and gas industry likes to avoid heat. Um, oh, okay. Increases failure rate, right? So, right. Um, especially with downhole technologies, yeah, that was I mean, one thing you, I was thinking about. Exactly. So when you're when you're when you're looking for oil and gas, you're not looking for heat. In some places, they coincide at, at, in in ranges that are interesting for geothermal. Um, but in most wells, they do not. Right. So the angle there would be well. So is it beneficial, economically speaking, to use an existing well that's drilled to say six kilometers, and um, you know use that first six kilometers and then deep deep in the well, right. re-enter and go further and deeper, right? Um, so there are companies thinking about this. Um, you know, some wells are being reused for heating projects, which needs. Um, you know, lower lower enthalpy, less heat. Okay. Um, so, you know, well reuse is interesting for that. Another problem, though, with well location is that if you want to use heat directly from a well, it needs to be located 
close, relatively right. close to an off taker, and you've got many oil and gas existing wells are remote. So there okay. are some challenges here. I know that this space is being subsidized. I mean, the, you know, the U.S. Department of Energy has recently funded some projects um, taking a look at this, some startups taking a look at this. Um, you know, from a you know, is oil and gas going to build a business model off of that specifically? Um, my my opinion is no, um, but will it be a way for oil and gas to tiptoe into it? So maybe using existing wells or, you know, say, you know, hot exploration wells mm -hmm. to test new concepts? Uh, yeah. I mean, there's 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 entities that are that are planning to do that now because so. it seems like the stars would really have to align in terms of yeah. the oil and gas well that tapped into this reservoir hydrocarbon reservoir is also and it's an very appropriate hot. well for right geothermal well and and that's not even getting into the the you know the, the more tedious questions like what about well integrity right you know what what's the condition of the cement mm -hmm. you know how big is that well because right. geothermal wells really want to be bigger than existing oil and okay. gas wells in terms of diameter Right, because you want high flow rates, right? So, I mean, there. But again, there are engineers out there. So, oil and gas people in the <laughs> world, um, please think about it and figure it out. Uh, uh, right now, there, you know, it's a it's a subsidized space, right? And I think that you know there is a, a good talking point there, and that the media likes to grab onto, right? Yeah, Which but that is, doesn't really sound like it's the future. You know, it's not going to be terawatts, mm -hmm. but there will be some. There will be something there, mm -hmm. and it may be you know testing ground, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, my concern on that is that if you were to pursue that full heartedly, that it kind of goes back to being niche. Exactly, so. and that is exactly not the message we want. Right, right. But there are company. You know, there's there's a there's a there's a geothermal project in South Texas right now pursued by a startup company that is using an, ex an existing oil and gas well to okay. do a geothermal test. Okay, and that's interesting because it does save money to to test. Right. But is it going to be a an operating asset for 50 years? No, that's not the intention. Right, right. Well, I like that approach of kind of let's reduce. If risk is one of your big concerns, yep. let's reduce the investment required yep. to do some of this testing by using existing wells. But let's recognize the that's limitations. Probably yes, that's probably not the future. Yeah, that's my view. All right, yeah. Shelby. Yep, we got a couple more. Um, this one comes from Hassan on LinkedIn, and he was wondering if you have any advice for maybe some emerging countries that want to take part in geothermal. Uh, for example, he, he mentioned some of the emerging countries in Africa um, that have taken steps towards becoming electricity producing uh, with geothermal. Do you have any advice for, for those wanting to get in on, on geothermal? Interesting. Yes. Oh, my goodness. So um, over the next year, there will be you know, two or three major global initiative lo initiatives launched for geothermal okay. that are um, focused on wrapping in developing nations that are predicted to be um, adding significant coal capacity over the coming decades for base load. So, so really kind of taking the initiative to uh, present an alternative. Correct. Or pursue an alternative. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. So, um, so yes, there will be opportunities and there will be um, real outreach in places in the world, um, India, Africa, South America, that are you know in pursuit of baseload clean energy, mm -hmm. um, are really looking for solutions and need geothermal demonstrations and characterization done. Right. Um, so I can't say anything about those yet, but they're coming, and there will be um, there there will be outreach for those things. So you know, hold tight. There's a ton of stuff happening and coming down the pike for geothermal over the next you know year. Um, that that's that's meant to to actually address those and it needs. could definitely be exciting. But then we recognize of with the large scale demand in some of those countries, and I guess the economics of investing in coal as an energy source. Right. That will be a tough battle. Yep. I think. Yeah. But that's you know, a tough battle even for oil and gas. I mean, of making the switch from coal to natural gas in some places. Right. Just because of the prevalence of coal plants coming online. Yeah. And so really the goal should be, well, why don't we make sure we're doing 
demonstrations, you know, geothermal demonstration projects in places okay. that are really in need of clean base load. Mm -hmm. And let's do, you know, the first plant and then the first five iterations in these places, okay. you know, and get the learnings under our belt in these geologies, mm -hmm. right, to where you've really, you're really poised for growth in places that need it. Okay. Right. And, and then in that, and that, if you look at that over the next, you know, by 2030, say, you've got geothermal positioned in places of the world to actually step in. Right. As the solution for baseload energy. Because you're almost coming in earlier. Yeah, and you've got costs down because you've iterated three or four times. Right, right. That makes sense. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Shall we? Yeah. And we have one more. And I think we kind of mentioned this a little bit about people wanting to dip their toes into geothermal. Um, but specifically, I wanted to ask what advice you might have for those who might still be students right now and um, who are looking to join the industry, who are excited, who maybe you know, are wanting to do something that helps the environment and, and uses kind of different, different um, e levels of, of education. And um, what, what advice would you have for those looking to join? It's a good question because mm -hmm. especially even now in oil and gas, we talk a lot about how do you attract young talent? Yeah. Um, and not, I shouldn't say young, but how do you attract talent, period? Well, you yes. start talking about geothermal. Okay. Hint, hint. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Right. Um, I... I get so many messages like this in my inbox that I can't open them from students saying, "Just getting inundated." Help me, help me, help me! I want to do this. I want to do this, but I'm, you know, I'm in a petroleum engineering department at oh, University really? X, and there's nothing here. There's no curriculum. There's no okay. In that situation, start it. Okay. Right. I mean, geothermal is is everything you see in geothermal right now that's happening, this renaissance and all this flourish of excitement, even within industry has been grassroots. Mm -hmm. I'm grassroots. Everybody around me <laughs> is grassroots. Right. I mean, starting from nothing and just snowballing. So like, you know, the, the, big, in, the big oil and gas entities that now have geothermal titled executives two years ago didn't have anything going on hardly. And some mid-level geophysicist decided to start a lunch group. Right. That then turned into an executive showing up. Okay. That then turned into a thing that then got taken to the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and this has happened really quickly. And so I would say within universities, it's really easy to start stuff like that. If Pursue you're student, it as a passion project. Absolutely. If your students start a, start a geothermal club. Okay. Get students talking about it. Go to your department chair if you're in a petroleum engineering or a geosciences department and say, we are excited about this as the future of subsurface science and petroleum engineering. We want curriculum. Okay. We want a geothermal 101 class. We want a geothermal well engineering class. At, at UT Austin, where geo is based, we had no geothermal curriculum two years ago. Now there's classes. You know, oh, wow. there's there's clubs. Does and, your presence kind of facilitate? Oh, I mean, UT Austin, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> but like every every university should have a me. Go do it. Like full permission, students out there, right? right? Go do it because you know I, it's it, it was something that snowballed so quickly at UT. You, you know, there there were no faculty really looking in geothermal, and now there's faculty with with labs focused on geothermal, and that happened in two years. Impressive. So there is a real. Um, there's a real appetite for this. It's easy to get excitement mm -hmm. built around it. It's easy to get results. And so students take matters into your own hands and start talking about it and, and build some momentum around it. Right. Um, you know, and, and you'll, you'll see it coming, you know, you'll get faculty that are excited about working with you if you express the energy. And probably for existing employees within oil and gas companies, Same it's really similar thing. in terms oh of my pursuing gosh. your passion project and why not become an expert in the field and distinguish yourself in that perspective yep. and just do something similar. And then in a couple of years when your entity decides that they're going to have a geothermal initiative, you become that person and that has happened right. already. It's happening right now. Become the expert. Correct. Or you lead the new geothermal program in X oil field service company. Right. That's exactly right. Interesting. Yeah. And to close that, I guess I'll ask one uh, question for the audience. <laughs> Um, where could, if people wanted to maybe learn more, is there someone you'd, somewhere you'd like to point them towards or maybe to contact you? Is there a, a link we can, we can give them or email? Yeah, so um, the more information thing, um, geothermal, 
uh, suffers from that a little bit in okay. that, um, you know, there, but there, but it's, it's cha- that's changing. So, you know, there, um, there are podcasts, there are blogs that are launching about geothermal, which is awesome. Um, you know, there, there's a, there's a, a, a large report that, that I'm about to publish that's coming out. It's called the future of geothermal in Texas. It's okay. funded by the Mitchell foundation. Oh, um, it comes out within weeks. It's robust. It's got 28 authors across the state of Texas wow. talking about, um, it's a multi-chapter report talking about what this resource, what, what this resource looks like looks like in Texas specifically. So stay tuned for that because it will end up being a, a good foundational work for learning more. Okay. Um, you know, I run a conference called Pivot. Um, Pivot. Nice name. Yeah, <laughs> right, Pivot. Um, it's it's free. It's a free conference, and it's online on YouTube. If you Google Pivot 2021, um, all the sessions are free. Okay. It's a great way. Really, Pivot, the purpose of Pivot is to get oil and gas industry folks talking about geothermal in a really open environment that's welcoming and excited about engagement um, of oil and gas. And so check out the, the Pivot recordings. Um, there are a lot of startups talking at Pivot, but there's also a lot of industry executives and, and veterans talking about geothermal. So that's a really good resource that's free. Um, yeah, and, and go to uh, texasgeo.org. That's my entity. Perfect. Um, and, and you can contact me through that website as well if you'd like to. There's, there's more information about what my entity is up to there as well. Well, great. Well, I think this was a super informative Mm -hmm. conversation. I'm glad we didn't have a time limit uh, because (laughs) clearly we had lots to discuss um, and plenty of audience engagement too. So I really enjoyed that. Well, thanks for having me. This has been fun. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. Shelby, anything else to add? Yeah. I just want to say thank you so much for our audience for tuning in and for asking your excellent questions. And um, thank you for tuning in every week. I want to also thank, of course, you as well, Lydia and Jamie. And our production team, uh, Paul Dufio and Wei Han Lin. So for that, thank you for joining the show today, and we will catch you next week.